in our distancing that we're trying to do or the past, I used to say a few weeks, but it's been long weeks now, hasn't it? I have celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday. I have celebrated an anniversary. Happy anniversary. But I find out a couple of things there, and this is what you need to be aware of now. Uh, when, when I got married, I was 19. And uh, my bride, Miss Charlotte over here, she was 17. <coughs> We got a 19 and a 17 year old, knowing nothing of what, uh, knowing that we just love one another. Amen. But now, um, I've grown older through the years, and I'm not sure she has. And this come to light during this uh, this thing that we're dealing with, this pandemic that we're dealing with. Did y'all know at Walmart they've taken out all the seats for people who. Um, well, their wife was still shopping because you married a younger woman and the old man has to go sit in the seat back up toward the front. Did y'all know they have taken all of those seats out? At Walmart, you're either shopping or you're leaving. <laughs> and it, and uh, what I'm suggesting to you uh, men, don't mar marry no younger woman. And go to Walmart and think that you can out shop her because it's not going to happen. It's not. And there's no place to sit. So the only other option is, Brother James, is to go sit in the vehicle. That that gets tiring after a while, but that's just some of the things that I'm that I'm learning in this event that we're going through together. If you've got your Bibles, you will turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 55. I want to share two verses with you. And the sermon is entitled, The Invitation. I, I love this sermon. Uh, it, it's a very good, for me, Memorial Day sermon because it, it reminds me that when it comes to God, <clears throat> God wants all armies to cease and to recognize who he is. God wants all nations to become uh, uh, at, at peaceful with one another so that we can have a peaceful war, but that's not going to happen until the King of Kings appears, Jesus Christ himself, and he sets up his kingdom rule on this earth. But there's always this invitation for us to stop fighting, number one, with God and with one another, and it's, a, it's an invitation for us to understand uh, what our lives are, are marching toward. And I want to give you some things to consider while you plan your next move. You might say, Brother Bobby, I'm not moving. Sure you are. You're going to lunch somewhere, and, and you're going to think about what you've heard this morning in the message, I believe. And so I just want to give you some things to help you as you consider your next move. I, I, I want to encourage you to use the Bible for your guidance system because it promises to lead you in this life and to eternal life, it actually promises to lead you to God. And it also promises to lead your enemies to God if they themselves will understand how wonderful Jesus, who died on Calvary's cross, it, how it has come out, fallen unto us to have eternal life. You see, we never stumble across words and chapters in the Bible. And I would encourage you to handle your Bible reading with belief and also with faith. The scriptures are a God-ordained divine appointment with the Lord who calls us, every one of us, to salvation. And as we plan our next step, let us dedicate our lives to a fresh new season of prayer. A couple of thoughts here. On this Memorial Day weekend, we have an opportunity to remember and honor one of our own American soldiers that gave their all. We can think back and we can know of individuals that we've been associated with. And it would pay us, it would do us well to think about where we've been, how far we've come. And smarter folks, there's a prayer bench out there that's never been out there before on Memorial Day. There's 12 flags out there and 12 crosses. 
as a memorial to the 12 people who have died during this pandemic just here in Dooley County. Now, I know, in all honesty, I've done some tough preaching, letting you know that God is in charge of this thing and God has allowed this to happen to us. God has permitted this. And I've even made the statement there that God said it, but not once have I looked back and, and with uh, being uh, hardened, uh, hardened with, with my own heart and my own thoughts to think for a minute that this thing is really expensive for us, this lesson that we're learning, right? This lesson that we're learning, 12 lives have been lost. And let me remind you what the Bible says. This comes from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. It says, good people pass away. The godly often die before their time. But no one seems to care or wonder why. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. Well, you get a chance here this <laughs> next week. I know how you guys do in your tractor, in your four wheel, in your whatever you're driving. Stop by Smyrna Church. Walk up to the front steps there. Pray a prayer. I can't name the people who have died with the coronavirus in Dooley County, um, but I can let you know this has been an expensive lesson for us, has it not? I mean, it really has. Let me remind you that God is still at work. And we're, in, in the midst of all this, once, once it's over with, we're going to have a new song to sing. And we, was, we should sing it with our whole heart. We're going to have a new message to give out and, and hopefully a new messenger to give it out. Someone who has, is experiencing the same things that you're experiencing. Pray for their families and pray for one another. Let me read these verses for you in Isaiah chapter 55. Ask the Lord, as Isaiah has been listening to him speak, and Isaiah says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thought, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What we see in these verses here is the assurance of a gracious welcome. According to verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 50, 55, we have the promise of, of, a, of, a, of an abundant welcome. Seek the Lord. Call upon him. Did you know that that thing, just like the pandemic, is worldwide in, it, in its invitation to us to come and to seek the Lord, to call upon his name? Did you know that applies to the unbeliever and to believer also? In this world, with all it contains, the word of God calls us to seek him. That's the best that we can do as we're dealing with all the things happening in our lives. We can seek the Lord. We can call upon his name. It is the Lord that must be sought. It is not happiness. It is not pleasures. It is not wealth, joy, power, or even peace. It's the seeking of that personal relationship with God. You see, by nature, human beings are estranged from God. Left untouched by the spirit of God, they will stay that way. No one naturally seeks after God, says the word. Tuesday of this past week, May 19th, my and mine and Charlotte's anniversary, <clears throat> Ravi Zacharias went home to be with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but you've probably heard me mention him time and time again because when it comes, as, comes to be a speaker, even in an audience that were uh, absolutely antagonistic against him, and they knowing that he, knowing that they hated him and the words that he was using and choosing, he could stand ground to ground with an atheist, with an agnostic, with someone of a different religion and explain to them how much better it was 
to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the most intelligent man that I have ever heard preach. And I quote him quite a bit. But he went home to be with Jesus. They take his name and look at Isaiah chapter 57 again, verse 1. His greatest verse was this, though. This is what really pulled him up out of that suicide bed at somewhere around the age of 17. John 14, 19, because I live, you will live also. And my one question, if, if I could have gotten the nerve, my one question for Ravi, because I don't know about you, but uh, when, when, I, when I'm standing or sitting or when I, I'm uh, listening to someone, that I, I am just convinced that the power of God is upon him and he has, he has measured himself well and he has lived his, his life well and, and I just can't wait for the next word that is saying if in the, even if I do have to uh, get a dictionary and look up the words, you know, but my one question for Ravi, if I had ever had a, an opportunity to talk to him and if I could have stood in such a, an individual's presence, and ask the question, it would have been this. After hearing the truth, why do so many believers remain unchanged? After hearing the truth, now you can't, you, you, you can't, after hearing the truth, why do so many people remain unchanged? And I finished that question with two words, including me. After hearing the gospel truth preached, why do so many believers remain unchanged? And I put myself in the mix too, including me. Now, I don't want you churchy answers. I know what they are. And I think they're revolting to God, and it upsets his stomach, if you know what I'm talking about. And it upsets other folks also. Why don't we remain so changed? Actually, when I began to remember the sermon that I preached last Sunday, I went back to James chapter 4, verse 9. I'm looking for the answer. But I'm not looking at, uh, for it from Ravi. I'm looking for it from God. Especially when I added those last two words, including me. Hear what James 4, 9 says. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. When I included me, why do so many believers' lives go unchanged? When I included me, that morning I thought about his, his life and his death. And I'd love to have asked him that question. A tear came into my eye and it was for real. My eyes started leaking. And that's how I know there's still hope for me. After I hear the gospel, and it doesn't change me like it's supposed to. You know why? Because here, here, here's the thought here. If sin in our own lives, if it doesn't drive us to tears, because we can name so many people that know, they need to hear that sermon more than I do. But when I hear it, if it doesn't drive us to tears, and God reminds me of my own sinfulness, do you notice that verse 7 there? Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Even the thoughts there. But if I can keep that thought of God to the point that when I hear something, it is supposed to change me for the good. It's supposed to change you for the good. You see, 
There's this merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence on our soul. He says, hey, seek me. Call upon me. And the words that I read to you this morning, they're written in the language of a lost relationship, a missing component. Put it in terms that we can understand. Have you ever sung one of those love songs because you have lost your love? What's that called a country song? Country song played backwards, you get everything back, right? Even your dog, Jake. It is written in the words of a, a romantic song. And God is saying, you've left me and you need to come back. Seek me and I'll be found. Words written in a, in a relationship and there's this one missing component of a true romance of the most intimate kind has been severed. And God says, come on back. Do you know he gave that to Adam and to Eve? The one at one time they, they walked with God in the cool of the day there. You, you will not find it that their children walked with God in the cool of the day there. That was reserved for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And, and that's the invitation that Jesus gives to us. Not like Adam and Eve had that relationship with God, but like that relationship that we can have when we know that our sins are forgiven. God isn't accepted or recognized as Lord by those who are enslaved to sin. The Lord is lost to the unbeliever in the sense that he isn't their friend. He isn't their savior. He isn't even their father. Matter of fact, Jesus told the religious leaders of his day, you are of your father, the devil. How did they get there? Because God is the only one that creates and gives life. How did these religious leaders get in such a condition that they were called, described by Jesus, as having Satan as their father. How did they get there? It's a broken relationship. And Isaiah invites the people of his day and the people of our day to return. You see, our first inclination is to run and to hide from the Lord in an attempt to escape. But God's got a grace plan. And it's for him to come near to us and for us to find him to be our salvation. To be our restored uh, love. That he, if he, that he tells us that you put your faith and your trust in me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You put your faith in me uh, and my righteousness. All these other things will be added to you. You see, when God comes near... We see that in verse 7. He will abundantly pardon. Uh, let that sink in. I, I'm one of those individuals. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm one of those in individuals that I, I, I believe in a, I guess it comes on from uh, the South. I believe in an okie dokie God. Let me tell you what that means. I believe in an okie dokie God. I, I come from a, a background of a re religious uh, zeal and uh, independent uh, Baptist and things like that. And I've seen all kind of worship services and I've, I've seen people do everything uh, <laughs> imaginable, not just in, in the independent bag background, but I, I've come to the conclusion, I, to the conclusion, and here it is, that there was this little girl. My friend was telling me this, that she... In one of those services, she came down to the altar and the preacher asked her when she got up, this little, this little girl had a, a, a learning disability. Y'all with her? She had a learning disability, but for some reason or another, in all of the activities that was going on, she came forward and she knelt at the altar and she prayed. And the pastor, um, he Ask her and say, what did you come for? And she said, I asked Jesus to come into my heart with the intelligence that God had blessed her with. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And the pastor said, well, what did he say? And the little girl said, 
He said, okie dokie. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that. Uh, I believe God is an okie dokie kind of God. Now, I'm not trying to shorten uh, uh, the, the confession that we need to do and all these other things. I'm just saying that right there at the moment when we realize that we need a Savior, God is there. Here is what it would look like as just the illustration of the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Think back now. The Lone Ranger, he being a cowboy and, and things like that. And Tonto, he being a an Indian. And somehow or another, they, they come together in this relationship. And they were fighting for the good. On one of these days, oh, the Lone Ranger, he believes in an okie-dokie God. He's got to ask Tonto. He says, here's the way it would work out. Tonto, you need to put your faith in Jesus. Pronto. You know what Tonto would say? Okie-dokie. I am, and I don't mind being, since I can't be anything near what Robbie Zachariah with his intelligence was. I'm an absolutely an okie-dokie preacher. You'll come to God with the intelligence that you have, like that little girl in that Baptist church. And, and I just died laughing when I thought about that. But later on, I mean, because I used to uh, use those words and phrases on my phone and things, I, but, but all of a sudden, I, I began to realize where that come from. That little girl praying in her own mind, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. You know what God said about that? Verse 7 says, he will abundantly pardon. Let me give that to you just in short terms. When God gets through with you, when he gets through bringing you into his kingdom, Nothing is left to forgive. That ought to make a Methodist happy. That ought to make a Baptist happy. Or anyone else that's listening under the sound of my voice. He says in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his ways. There's got to be a lifestyle that is turned from. He goes and says, in the unrighteous person, his thoughts. God re renews the believer's mind. And I don't know about you, but since I'm an okie-dokie fellow that's been saved by an okie-dokie God, I have to have my mind re renewed every day. Anybody else in here like that? Let me see your hand. I ain't trying to get anybody saved. I have to have my mind renewed every day. And guess what? He leaves no stone unturned, nothing left to be forgiven. And the unrighteous person, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy and abundantly pardon. Now you know what it means to stand before God one of these days and it be just a blank sheet there when it comes to your sins. There's nothing left to forgive because we live daily under the judgment of being a child of God. Other people recognize that and they try to shy away from us because... We've asked forgiveness and it's made, been made available to us. You see, there's a God-seeking season. There's a set time when the Lord makes himself available. Might I suggest to you, probably, I don't know if the numbers have reached 100,000 yet, but it will be this next week, won't it? who have gone out into eternity. Wouldn't you say, if he's a God who can forgive sins, he is in the process of doing that more than ever before, especially to those who are going out to meet him. I say all that to tell you this. God comes near to an evil heart. And there can only be two outcomes, salvation or judgment. And I want to share this with you. This comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. It says, Jesus' death and life has made salvation possible for everybody for all. 
Romans chapter 10 verse 6 says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Nobody has to go get Christ and, and, and go to heaven to find salvation. Christ himself has come down here. Verse 7 says, Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Nobody has to do that. Verse 8 says, But what saith it? Then how is it going to happen? And the Bible says, The word is nigh thee, even unto thy mouth and in thy heart. And that is the word of faith which we preach. And then Paul gave it out. Verse 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. Nothing that an individual can do except listen to the invitation of a lost love. God so loved the world. No, oh, by the way, that includes his enemies. Verse 10 reminds us, for with the heart, man uh, believes, and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Don't that just sound like something that God would do? I mean, he, he, he hasn't made it a secret. It, but it's a window of opportunity for salvation, not a lifetime of days without end. And here's the prayer. And I hope he gives us a new season of prayer. And this is how simple that it is. I pray my prayer in Jesus' name, asking him to forgive my sin and shame. I traded my guilt for his gift of grace, a promise God made from Calvary's hill where he took my place. Now I stand condemned no more. Pray a prayer in Jesus' name. Do you know one prayer from you could do more than a million prayers for somebody else? For yourself. Pray a prayer in Jesus' name. For the living and the dying. Because in Jesus' eyes, we're all the same. Pray a prayer in Jesus' name. We're going to have an invitation, and Charlotte's going to um, send this invitation. And this is the way it's going to work since 